And other than that, I hope you enjoy the afternoon and I'll hand over to Tammy. Thanks, Sean. So this is a really timely panel, um, not only because of the global implications of uh, the coronavirus pandemic, but also in the context of the larger discussion around players' health and return to play. Concussions have been in the news quite a bit over the past few years from both a, an advocacy and public safety standpoint, but also from a legal standpoint uh, around return to play issues and issues around liability. Um, this is a conversation that I have regularly with people, and that is how do we protect the athletes who are putting their health and safety on the line um, as they are entertaining us? Um, and so we're very fortunate to have a global representation on the panel today, and I'm very excited to hear what they have to say. I want to go ahead and start off with Loic and start off by giving us a, a sense of the global uh, state of play, as it were, from your perspective. Um, well, as an organization, first, I want, I, want, I want to clarify that we do not negotiate directly the return to play protocols and, and, and collective bargaining. What we've been involved in though is like gathering all information we could on, on like our membership and also our different stakeholders and try to make sense of the scarce information we have being like medical implications or legal implications. Um, and we've all, we've, our, our bottom line was always to make clear that the duty of care cannot shift because there is more risk at the moment, it has to stay with, with, with the clubs, with the employers, with the, with the organizer of the competitions. Uh, so starting from there, basically, we've had to, to build from scratch, just the same as the other stakeholders. So we spent a lot of time in, in various meetings and trying to put like all guiding principles that I, I think Brendan will touch upon afterwards um, and, and, and give documents and advice that enable our constituency basically to critically approach whatever protocol we will present them to come back to play in, in like safe in a safe environment. So as you can imagine, as like we, we, we are a global organization, it's very fragmented what we've seen um, from like very high level from to the very bottom measures in some countries where I guess we will elaborate a bit later, but you have to face situations such as England or Germany, where it's rather highly professional. And then you go to another side of the world and you're dealing with athletes having to accept food packages during the crisis. So then it makes you wonder under which uh, conditions are they going to come back to play and under which conditions is it going to be negotiated as well. So yeah, to, to, to summarize, very fragmented and trying to give like a critical angle to our members to properly assess what we are proposing them. That's, that's fantastic. So in the context of that, um, Brendan, given the, the, the reasoning around the principles of duty of care owed to players, um, how, do we, how do we take an evidence-based approach to this? How are you all, how are you all approaching this um, from a global perspective? Well, I think there's been two key pieces of knowledge at a macro level that we've had to get our head around. And I would say that in our time, this has probably been the most difficult issue we've had to deal with because we've had to try and understand a public health crisis, a player health crisis, and an economic crisis simultaneously, and then make two very consequential decisions in a very short period of time. Do we stop playing and then when do we resume? And what kind of economic uh, readjustments do we uh, negotiate? Um, and the guiding principles which where we come from, and of course we include football, but all the other major sports, is that we need to take a science-based and an evidence-based approach. And that's been difficult because there's still so little known about the direct impact um, of the virus. Um, so in the short time available, I, I would like to really emphasize um, a couple of points. Um, the first one is that we take more than a, a, a tortious approach to the question of responsibility. Um, FIFA is one of, and we've now seen the International Olympic Committee start to move towards uh, embedding human rights into their constituent documents and the governance of sport in accordance with the United Nations guiding principles. And health is a fundamental right in a number of respects. According to ILO standards, 
uh, also including to the fundamental standards of the UN. And by that, we're talking physical health, mental health, and well-being. Um, and much has been spoken about that. This means that the sports bodies and the employers need to be aware of harm that they could be causing, harm that they could be contributing to, or harm with which they could be directly linked. So it's a much broader notion of risk than what we would look at through the strict um, basis of causation, say from a tortious uh, point of view. The way in which a sports body can approach that is they need to undertake on an ongoing basis uh, what we call a due diligence. And um, that is to obtain all the relevant facts, not just about players, but also the families and the other people with whom the players are coming in into contact um, in order to then be able to make an informed assessment. Now, um, what does that actually mean? It's difficult if we look now the, the, the second aspect word I'd like to emphasize, that's the process. The second is what are the particular issues when we're dealing with, with COVID-19? If we look at most of the protocols to date, they're very much focusing on social distancing. They're focusing on preventing the spread um, of the virus, and then some form of isolation or quarantining process in the event that the virus is contracted within the group. And there's various ranges. Some are talking about a complete quarantine hub of a league, some of clubs, what level of testing is required. All of these issues are being dealt with. And in the main, the more sophisticated leagues are very strong on, on ensuring that we prevent um, the, the, the contraction and, and, and the, the virus and the, within the sporting hub or the environment that we're trying to create, bearing in mind that we're dealing with a fundamental paradox, which is contact sport is not social distancing. So um, that gets to the, the, the element. So protocols, okay on uh, top, stopping the spread. What happens, however, if the disease is actually contracted within the group? And the initial advice, for example, from the International Olympic Committee's medical team was that athletes would only suffer mild flu-like um, symptoms. We now know that's not the case. Young people have been very, very, very sick with this virus. We've seen concerning fatality rates, say for example, out of the United States for people between the ages of 20 and 45 who are the group of the athletes. Uh, people with high body mass index, such as rugby players, American football players, people from uh, uh, what we say, Bain communities, African-American communities have also, for whatever reason we don't quite understand, shown an increased vulnerability to the virus. So what we need to make sure is if an athlete does contract the virus, that they're protected. And one of the issues that we are concerned about is how's that risk going to be managed? We've now seen, for example, in rugby that athletes may be asked to sign waiver clauses. Um, athletes in Japan, for example, may not be considered workers, therefore they won't be entitled to protection under national workers' compensation insurance. And in other sports, we have private insurance arrangements which may have exclusion clauses which uh, don't cover, for example, the pandemic. So there is a real danger that athletes will be economically or legally exposed in addition to the health. Um, and of course, we not only need athletes to be able to get healthy again, they need to be able to recover an elite level of fitness so that their careers are not otherwise um, jeopardized. So in a nutshell, Tammy, they're the, the major issues and the, the approach that we're encouraging uh, the sports bodies. What I can say is this is very sophisticated in terms of the approach and I do worry about those athletes that do not have the support of player associations that belong to organisations such as FIFPRO or in North America, where we can get our own medical and scientific advice so that we can bring that to the table and discuss this with the sports um, in a relatively equal position. Because as I said in opening, the economic pressure is enormous and that economic pressure can result in decisions being made quickly, which may exacerbate the risk. I think those are great points and I have about 72 follow-up questions that we're gonna to get to, but I wanna to go to Mark next. And in the context of what we've heard from Loic and from Brendan on the global perspective, um, how then do we talk about balancing the risk of harm, um, the 
reasonableness of harm and what we should look at with respect to that responsibility. Well, what, what I think um, Loic and Brendan on behalf of their organisations have started to bring forward is what is that sort of mutually acceptable or at least mutually manageable risk associated with return to play. And what they're trying to do is make sure that when we're talking about reasonable risks and the Bundesliga have said, you know, they can't guarantee 100% that nobody will catch it. What they're talking about is return to play with medically justifiable risk of contracting the virus. So governing bodies know it's not, they can't completely get away from it. But at least what we've got FIFPRO and World Players Association doing is trying to give a framework for discussion about what is the appropriate uh, level of risk and type of risk that can go, uh, that, that players could be exposed to when they do return. But one of the big problems, and I'm sure we'll come back to this, is we don't have any, there's, there's, a, there's a complete lack of um, unequivocal advice, advice about the spread of COVID-19. So it makes it extraordinarily difficult to put these protocols in place. So when we're talking about it being within a, a legal framework and what is reasonable in terms of returning to play, it's very difficult to say whether or not players are safe. And as Brendan has already alluded to, the different levels in contact in different sports are, are important. And even in some relatively low contact sports like netball or basketball, you're still incredibly close the entire time. And what we don't seem to have is, is, a, is a very robust level of scientific evidence to explain about what is an appropriate amount of interaction, even in non-contact sports. And in particular, what is an appropriate level in the, in the heavy contact sports like rugby or American football, where contact is required for the game. And um, I was sure many of you will have seen Dr. Anthony Fauci's interview last week, where he just basically said the American football and you know, by analogy codes like rugby are near perfect for transmission of the disease from your face to your hands, to your clothing, to someone else's clothing, and then onto their face. The other thing that's been interesting as well, we, uh, the British government's um, uh, advice on all of this and, and other governments and sports bodies have talked about this as well as about shared equipment, but almost everybody isn't treating the ball as a shared equipment. Right. So where it's talking about other bits of equipment, it's saying wash your hands, wash the equipment, then you can pass it on. Clearly you can't do that in ball sports. Uh, there are ways you can reduce it. You can, every time a ball goes out of play, you can produce a clean ball. But nobody seems to be talking about whether the ball can transfer from hand to the, the surface of the ball. And obviously, most balls have different textures and different materials that they're made of. Mm -hmm. Cricket's come out and said you can't spit on the ball, but you can use sweat. But then the Australian Institute for Sport have said don't use sweat either because we don't know if it's transferable through sweat. So again, it's just every, every step of the way we've got either vague or conflicting evidence about what we should do. So when it comes to the, the, the two key legal questions, we know that duties are going to be owed. Duties of care are going to be owed in this situation because we now know that coronavirus is out there. We know that it's, tra it's transmittable when playing sport because of the close interactions that people will have. So the issue of duty of care is probably not going to be live in the vast majority of jurisdictions. What Loic and Brendan have started to introduce, though, is, is what's reasonable. And that's where we get into the breach of duty. And all of that will have to be taken into account when we try and work out whether a sport as a whole or a competition or a governing body or even a club's protocols are actually at, are sufficient in any given situation. But from a legal perspective, and I won't go into this in detail now, but just sort of flag it up for more discussion, the problems about causation where did you catch the disease? And you don't know, what, unless you've got these completely isolated bubbles, uh, like uh, Rugby League in Australia talked about potentially completely isolating everybody, or maybe even playing on an island. Um, unless you've got that, you don't actually know where you might have caught it from. So you've got to be able to have the contract, contact tracing as well, because mm -hmm. did you catch it on the way to the stadium, at the stadium, whilst you were playing? Did you get it from your food delivery? Did somebody in your household, have they contracted it and passed it to you? 
the, 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 from a legal perspective, the causation issue is absolutely key to all of this, and it may need developments in the law in a number of jurisdictions. The closest analogy I can find in the UK law would be how they dealt with industrial diseases like mesothelioma, where nobody knows where you breathe in the asbestos that led to the mesothelioma. We're, we're talking about potentially being in a, diff, in a similar situation there. We don't know where you actually caught the disease from. Again, more follow-up questions I will have to that. Um, but I think, and we're, we're really fortunate to have Gareth on the panel because I think that a lot of times the actual player's perspective is left out on this and they're the ones doing the actual work and they're the ones putting their bodies on the line. So Gareth, I'd be interested to know your perspective about this in general, not only as a solicitor, but also as a former player who has experienced this firsthand. I'm unmuted, sorry, um, slightly strange. It's probably better muted than unmuted. Um, I've, I've been fascinated with the panel. I've been fascinated with our previous conversations. And one of the key things, and you, you've touched on it there, that becomes really, really interesting to me is the complexity of all of this. And for people who are listening, we obviously had a discussion briefly around the foreseeability of harm, but yet we don't know what that harm is yet. There's no scientific evidence we're going through the pandemic as we sit and speak. Dependent on the quality of leadership in any given jurisdiction, some people are quite clear and comfortable with, with what the particular course is, even where they're up to with regards to the pandemic itself. The challenge for me sometimes with these things is, like you say, you naturally get introduced as an ex-player, but the decision-making process and the challenges that each player faces with regards to making an informed decision whether to return or not. And obviously, where I've been quite fortunate is you make that transition into having a basic understanding of some of the legal terms around causation, foreseeability, which, let's be fair, when you're dealing with players, is not remotely in their vocabulary in most cases. And they need people they can trust. They need people they can trust. They need people that can simplify the message. And obviously, I'm a huge advocate of both Brendan and Loic and Fief Pro with regard to that. In coming to the topic of the duty of care and the return to play, even that is a vast uh, subject. And in preparation for the panel, as I'm sure lots of people have been doing over the last couple of weeks, every day there's a new protocol, every day there's an updated report, and you read it and you think, well, hang on a second, I'm actually no further forward than I was three to four days ago. And the reason I say that is to try and counter being a lawyer now, I said, I think I need to speak to some current and former players with regards to what their thoughts are and also people that are working in clubs. So we can talk about each step in isolation. So we have phase one, which is a return to play and possibly the reasons that sit behind that. And I think everybody can understand that. And I think Brendan touched on it that for me, you would like to hear definitive leadership saying that one of the primary returns and reasons to return is economic. That's, that's the immediate aim, is that the economy has been so heavily affected by the lockdown, if you like, and that there's a desperate need from an economic point of view, given the threat to the survival of certain sports, clubs, leagues, everything that goes with that, and then the obligations around media, broadcasting, and all of those different elements. But... Even within the economic element, I still don't think you can move away from the player voice. And that's kind of what I'm seeking. And if people were to say to me, and different people have had different conversations so far, where they would say, what's the utopian lesson that we're going to learn from COVID-19? Like, are we going to have that um, awakening or huge shift towards, back towards a value-based sports industry, as opposed to everything being about the globalization, commerciality, and uh -huh. revenue. And I think that's a conversation that we need to have. And I think that it should be very much at the forefront of people's minds because what we have seen is that despite sport, the wealth and revenue associated with it, revenue, it's still never enough. So in some ways, there needs to be a recalibration of that belief system around sport. And that's what athletes want. And I think athletes now, for me, need to recognize the strength of their voice within all of this. And they have Brendan, they have Loic, and obviously the unions 
in each country to recognize the strength that's there and start to um, use that in a positive way. Because again, when we talk about lockdown and we talk about not having sport for a period of time, the fundamental reality is without those participants, sport doesn't work anyway. With regards to the second limb of the duty of care, we get into a situation now where people are returning to play, training phase one before we even get to phase two, and we may not get to phase two. But within that phase one return, you have a duty of care, which is slightly different to what Mark spoke about. And that is players are being asked to shortcut what would be a normal preseason preparation mm -hmm. to return to play. You've got a situation where they're being asked to um, get ready for matches within three weeks, one of which will be phase one, similarly phase two, and possibly one week of actual contact before going straight into games. And that's an incredible ask for anybody because what will happen irrespective is you're going to have broadcasters and media judging those players as they always do from the comfort of their sanitized backgrounds and in their world returning to revenue and being paid for talking about the game without there being that balanced view of the reality for the player. And, and, and I think that's important as well, that there's going to have to be a balance and a strength where people say, well, no, hang on a second here. We've had three weeks. And I think that's one of the things that setting definitive dates for matches returning in certain, certain jurisdictions, obviously it's not set in stone and there is a likelihood, hopefully that a balanced decision will be made if those dates need to be pushed out a week or two weeks. But as an example, and again, going back to the panel, if you look at Germany who have um, implemented incredible uh, protocol and obviously are the uh, pallbearers in many ways, if you like, by having played their first games last week. But if you look already at that, you had a situation where one of the German clubs had seven injuries in the uh -huh. three week return. There was 14 injuries from the games at the weekend. There's been no games this week, but they're moving into a cycle now where they're going to play Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. So again, mm -hmm. you can only say that the players are going to be under incredible pressure in relation to that. There's no protocol can deal with that. This is even, this is a separate duty of care from having a conversation around coronavirus. This is actually to do with the player welfare itself. And again, within today, then I started looking at, if you look back at uh, the US lockout in 2011 with the NFL, so obviously you ended up in a situation then where the players didn't play for four months and they were obviously there was a deal done and then the players were rushed back and you ended up in a situation that within the first um, four to six weeks of return, you had 12 Achilles ruptures mm -hmm. from players. So that comes back to the point that everybody has kind of touched on and something that I think has to be considered is the fact that we can talk about COVID in isolation and we could have an eight hour seminar based on the protocols, the developments, the evolutions, scientific evidence, and it's moving so fast. I'm comfortable with people setting out that we need to look at a return to play, but then the second part of that duty will be looking at the illness, its evolution, scientific research, which is very, very difficult given the fact that we don't know where this pandemic is at compared to SARS or different yeah. Um, um, incidents. So, G G G Gareth, um, could you, I think we've got some questions. You provoked a bunch of questions, I think, <laughs> from people yeah. uh, with that. Tammy, is it all right if we take some questions? Do you mind? Um, think... Yeah, no, I've got, I've got a couple, yeah. but they can uh, yeah, maybe so, they'll be addressed by some of the folks in the okay, queue. So, so. Yeah, so, so sorry, Sean, the last point then. So the last point is within that duty of care, the last point we get to then is back to the actual player welfare. How are players going to fare? If you're losing 10 players every weekend, we're going to end up in a situation pretty quickly where the youth teams are going to be playing. And who, who does that serve? Especially given that some of those players may be out of contract and the knock-on issues and the bigger issues that come with that. So that's... Wow, that's a, a great point. Um, so we've got uh, Barrington Atkins, will be Atkins according to this, but I know it's Barrington. <laughs> um, I'm a sports injury solicitor. Uh, on behalf of uh, professional footballers, I've been contacted by players who will consider legal action should they become injured following a return to work. What is your view on the clubs being held liable for players who suffer injury or death as a result of COVID-19 following a return to football? So it really follows on, Gareth, from, from what, I think it follows on from what everyone said thus far. Uh, Tammy, who do you want to direct that to? Well, I'd like that to, I'd, I'd be interested in that going down the, the panel line again. And I would add on to that, um, 
a note I was going to make for later too, in the U.S. and I think in other jurisdictions, we're seeing companies trying to fight for liability protection. They want to be legally protected against liability uh, if their employees develop the virus. And I think I'd be interested to know the answer to Atkins' question, Mr. Atkins' question, but also in the context of how all of these different jurisdictions can't decide on anything regarding a protocol, how are we going to come up with what the standards are that if complied with very strictly would protect companies or organizations from liability? So Loic, I'd be really interested to know your thoughts on that to start. Yeah, sure. Um, but I, I think the answer comes back to what Mark was saying and also what Brendan was saying. Um, what is reasonable? Um, and what, what what would be reasonable will also depend on what has been agreed in the protocol. And what is agreed in the protocol also depends on how was that agreed? Like, what was the process for that? So uh, if you're in a country where there is no union, for instance, um, there is no player's voice. So you could probably imagine that if it ends up in court, um, well, the burden of proof on the club will be even higher because there was absolutely no consultation. So in terms of liability, this, this raises the question. Um, also, I think this is also why, why like as, as FIFA Pro, what we told our membership was that like you need a case by case approach. It's a domestic issue, what you will eventually end up agreeing. Because I believe that the scope of the duty of care will pretty much depend on how and what was agreed in the protocol. So let's take two examples. Uh, if you have a very strict hub, for instance, like this bio hub that the NBA and, and, and rugby have been discussing, so you put players into one place for X amount of time. Well, the measures are very strict. You probably highly reduce the, 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 the health and, and safety issues, but your duty of care is shifting towards another risk, which is the psychological risk for the players. And um, what we've seen actually during the pandemic and the lockdown across the world is that players are not are different from us. So you put them into lockdown and they tend to develop uh, uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a duty of care liability turn towards a, a physical risk, then you have it more on the psychological risk. And then you open another uh, door, which is uh, the individual freedom of a player to access his family. So if you put him for X amount of time in a lockdown situation with the entire team, he cannot access his family. And then if you take like another protocol, which would be a bit looser. So maybe you might sacrifice a little bit uh, the testing and the player is able to come home. So his individual rights are better respected. Well, then the duty of care is more on the physical harm and it's the immediate harm, but also the long-term one. And the immediate harm we know a bit better now because we've been in the, in the, in the, in the pandemic situation for a couple of months, but the long-term one, there's no empirical studies. So the foreseeability, is, is, is close to null at this point. And the, 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 the last point I, I wanted to, to make is that those protocols are really hard to define also because it comes down to very nitty gritty details sometimes. So if you decide that you're going to have a loser solution, a bit like in Germany, so they test it at day zero and then day seven, well, first you need good labs, Usually it comes back within 24 hours. That's fine. Um, one could argue, well, in Europe, you have enough labs. You also have enough tests. That's okay. But within 24 hours, the player keeps moving around. He goes to his family. Maybe he trained actually. So let's assume that the, the test was reliable and it doesn't come back as a fake negative or a fake positive. It's accurate. Still, actually, you don't know if he has contracted it within 24 hours. Right. So yeah. if, you, the duty of care is really difficult to assess and, and actually even the, pro the protocol would be agreed on a case like a domestic level, case by case basis, but the liability question to come back then to uh, the question of, of, of the participant uh, will, will be even like more rooted into the case by case analysis of this very player towards the very club and how the protocol was actually agreed upon what terms basis. No, I think that's I think that's an exceptional point. Brendan, did you have any any thoughts on that, especially, you know, you'd already mentioned 
issues around the Olympics and larger scale events like that as well. I'd be very interested to know your thoughts on that. Well, if we're talking about the question of liability, um, it's true. Uh, employers in the United States are seeking to be immune. Um, and there's a, probably a justification for that in that this is a public health crisis and the business risk has, has, has come from a public health um, cause. So, so we can understand that. In, however, California, for example, there is a presumption being made that um, con contracting the virus in the course of work will presumed to be, be a workplace um, injury. So we still won't even have a, 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 a consistent statutory regime within one country, let alone on, on, on a global basis. This is not new for athletes, Tammy. It should be aware that many athletes struggle to be recognised as workers. Uh, even in some jurisdictions, such as where I'm originally from in Australia, athletes are excluded from workers' compensation legislation. And so the protections have been privately and collectively bargained um, for a long time. When it comes to liability, though, I look at it more from a bargaining perspective rather than a, a suit uh, that's going to dominate the courts for a long period of time. Here we have a disease which is highly contagious, which can't be treated by drugs in a reliable way, um, and for which there is no vaccine. So from that point of view, the risk is, from a bargaining point of view, um, incredibly foreseeable. And what we need to do is to try and prevent the economic and the legal pressure being put um, on, on to the athletes because that's not managing or mitigating or minimizing the risk. It's just allocating it there. Mm -hmm. And where the athletes lack a voice, the risk will be put onto them. Now we know that when sport first started, the voluntary assumption of risk was almost in the DNA of sport. Right. Why would you play this thing? You're going to get hurt. The athlete has, uh, and, but then of course um, sport became, um, or work. I think there's been some great points made by the panel and what I would say in terms of some athletes, I really want to emphasize or re-emphasize some. The correlation between the hub environment and mental health is acute. Uh -huh. And we are seeing quite a lot of athlete groups refusing the hub environment for a long period of time. Testing has to be regular, systematic and ongoing. And in countries where there's a lack of accessibility to testing, the athletes have made it clear that they do not want privileged access. Uh, the reputational consequences for that are counterproductive. Gareth made some sensational points about load. And one of the key principles that we're emphasizing is that the usual player health and safety protocols that would apply, um, and I've seen some questions about concussions or, um, or questions around a whole variety of issues, including load, they must also apply. Um, and, and, and that is a really important issue that, that, that needs to be emphasised in the negotiation. And then the final point I would put in uh, as well is every athlete is indeed different and every athlete is entitled to a voice. And so one of the really important issues being bargained in a number of countries is should an athlete have the right to opt out? If an athlete um, forms the view that the workplace is not safe, um, and it may not just be because of the athlete's personal uh, health, but it may be that he or she has an infirm relative uh, mm -hmm. or, or a grandmother or a young child. We had one example referred to of, of, of a young child with respiratory illnesses. Should that athlete be entitled to opt out because it's not safe? And if so, what are the economic conditions of that opt out? These are the types of issues which are uh, being worked through, but the overwhelming consensus we're getting from the athletic groups is, hey, we're not going to hold out forever over this. We need to be able to manage this risk. We do want to return to play. Um, the question is, you know, w where do we get the risk uh, balance right? Um, Tammy, I think sorry. that's right. What's sorry, that? Sorry. Sorry, Terry. That you got you, you were there provoking loads of questions. There's a there's a shed load of questions that, that are there. Um, uh, uh, I'll try I'll try and group them up. Tammy, interject, or if you want to like rephrase or whatever you want to do, because um, a lot of them are the ones that you know we spoke about uh, on the prep call. I know that you covered off um, under 18s, basically minors. There's a people talking about. Uh, um, we've got Joseph Hodge in the chat. Basically said, where do players between 16 and 18 stand, or just minors generally, 
on this. Well, let's here. let's talk about that in a larger context and give yeah. folks a chance to kind of whip down the, the role, not only under 18s, but um, maybe in your answers, give us some context. Uh, we see in the press that there's this, and I, I take it personally because these are a lot of my friends, you know, you should take a pay cut, you know, a real, uh, a real paternalism in the way that players are being demanded that they that they do this as if all of the players playing around the world in any sport are all making millions and millions of pounds and euros and dollars every week. You know, I think in a previous law and sport podcast, I someone gave the stat that I think half of footballers across the world make less than a thousand euros a month. And so when you talk about minors um, and you're talking about amateur athletes, obviously I could have an entire podcast on the NCAA and how they're demanding that unpaid athletes who don't have access to universal health care are going to come back and play college football in, you know, six weeks. Um, so let's, let's do a touch, a real quick touchdown on issues around minors, uh, issues around amateurs, um, with context around players that are just not making millions of dollars per week. So, um, Gareth, I actually like you to start with that, if you wouldn't mind. Um... <laughs> I can, you, again, even within a question, we could end up, when you break the questions down, the, like, so we, we talk about the return to play and we go back to the economics of this, right? The immediate priority around return to play is economic and getting players back to play to satisfy um, broadcasting contracts, be it um, behind closed doors, all of the different conversations. And again, even within the panel, how we're moving around with all of the conversations. So within the list of priorities, People have started rightly to ask the questions now around what happens with regards to the under 18s, what happens with regard to amateur, amateur sport, and in some cases now the governments or authorities, associations who are taking their lead sequentially are in a position where they're saying, right, we're looking at that now and then we're going to come back to you with regards to the potential return to play. I think the challenge as a panel is even within the questions we're being asked is that they, they go off into another sphere. And obviously we talk about going off into different tangents about the earnings, and then we talk about the contractual points and we can talk about the potential injury points. But I am less, not say less concerned because amateur sport to some people is they live for it and they can't wait to be back playing their particular amateur sport. With regards to the under 16s and under 18s, be that in a professional or in an amateur environment as well, there's different challenges there at the moment. I think the focus is starting to move to that. But if you look at how we've had the evolution of this uh, pandemic so far in the footballing context, which is what you said, is it, it's, it's quite um, slow because we did. We had, we had government in the UK for everybody coming out initially and making vast sweeping comments that footballers who earn a certain amount of money should be giving that money to charity because of the issues around the NHS. Wholly um, wrong as far as I'm concerned. And kind of atypical of the leadership we've, we've been dealing with in this country, where there's no clarity and the lack of leadership has actually thrown up far more questions and challenges than countries mm -hmm. that you would say are the example of best practice at this particular time. That's what makes every conversation bigger than that pandemic, because we're still going to be dealing with those issues. Where the association stakeholders and the unions have been quite good is that they have sought to lead. And I think quite proactively, with regards to um, when games will be cancelled, when leagues must be coming back, and issues around European competitions, the integrity of competitions, and fundamentally everybody's desire that those be finished correctly by the games being played. Now again, even within that, we have European countries that have taken different decisions already, France, mm -hmm. Holland, and again, that's, so that's another topic, another day's conversation around that. So, I think the immediate priorities we can focus on, discuss and deal with, but there are naturally going to be slippage or new issues around amateurs. We have a situation in Ireland at the moment where they're going through a situation where the actual the domestic league is the only league, I think, in Europe. Even Moldova came back with a plan to return this week where the return to play hasn't been formalised and the plan put in place for that to happen in Ireland. But that hasn't stopped people from the amateur game standing up and saying, well, what's the protocol going to be and when can we look to return as well? So I think it's sequential with regards to, we've seen the Bundesliga come back, 
Now there's plans for other leagues and dates with regards to potential returns. And then I think there will be a natural uh, gravitation towards looking at amateur returns. But again, I don't envy anybody that has to deal with all of those things because they're by no means straightforward. Sure. And I mean, you make a great point about all the jurisdictional issues. Um, I, I will never remember the name of the golf course, but I know there's a golf course that splits England and Wales. And I think you tee off in Wales on four and putt out in England and they don't have the same protocols on social distancing and that's the home nations. Um, Mark, I'd like to get to the, the, the issue about the minors and the under 18 from a legal perspective, when you talk about assuming that kind of risk, how do you have this discussion about people assuming risk on behalf of people who cannot legally assume it on their own? I think it's, it all comes back to a fundamental problem with the protocols to begin with. So I'll, I'll sort of roundabout come back to that because we're talking about protocols that they're talking about from a, a sports level or sometimes at a competition level or an elite level. And Gareth's already highlighted it could be very different at, at the amateur level. The protocols also need to evolve as we learn more about the disease, but also the UK government's already said that each sport has to have a bespoke protocol, but how far does that have to go down in terms of how, dis how bespoke does it have to be? So we've had the question raised about um, uh, 16 to 18 year olds. Well, there's an issue there about whether they should be subjected to the same protocols as the adult players. You've then got separate issues potentially with women's sport. <clears throat> And then when you talk, we, we, we mentioned earlier on about the BAME athletes and how they seem to have twice the fatality rate of non-BAME athletes. So should there be, at which point we're then talking about, should the protocols actually be instituted almost on an individual level rather than on a sport level? So what, what is reasonable? And um, you know, Chelsea have been very good in saying that N'Golo Kante doesn't have to train and may not play in the remaining nine games if they go ahead. But you can imagine other sports saying, I'm sorry, you're our absolute star player and we want you. Mm -hmm. and, and even if not legally putting the pressure on, certainly morally putting the pressure on to return to play. So I think we do have to be very careful about not thinking that once we've got a protocol for a sport, that it applies to the whole sport, but mm -hmm. also that it, that it may need tweaking for individuals within that sport. So to come back to the, the issue of the minors, I think that's what we need to then try and address is are there additional risks in, in respect of COVID uh, that we need to take into account for um, under 18s or as it appears to be that the under 18s are at least less symptomatic even if not catching it should they be kept away from everybody else because we can't tell whether they've got it or not because yeah. so many of the uh, so are they a danger in being brought in rather than being in need of specific protection. So I think, I think we've got to be aware of all of these issues. And as Gareth said, you know, once we get into the, the second stage of this and we're seeing the number of injuries from people coming back to play too soon, if there is a chance that the youth players might come in, then we need to make sure that they are following protocols that are appropriate, not only for their age group, but then appropriate for when they're in a mixed age group, if they have to play with the first team. Um, I think that's I think that's a good shout. Um, I've got some follow-up questions, but Sean, what's the what's the chat look like? Uh, the chat. <laughs> hey, see, this is this is what American America like. Tammy's uh, like, I love that. Sorry, what's the chat look like? That's brilliant. Uh, made what's my day. I feel like I'm on an American talk show. Um, the chat looks like uh, <laughs> that's as close as I'm going to get to being an American talk show. Uh, the chat. Looks like Bill Draper um, made a, a point following on, I think, really from what Mark was saying. Um, on the knock-on effects and um, bigger issues touched upon is surely the integrity of a competition. It, it, the integrity of the competition is integral and is not one that should be compromised no matter the circumstances. Do the panel feel the economic financial pressures is leaving governing bodies and leagues in a position where they are compromising the integrity of the competition just to protect their financial position? So it's kind of related in the sense of this eagerness to get back and reliant on youngsters. Um, you know, is is... You know, is there other things that are being compromised as well as people's safety? Is the integrity of competitions also being compromised? Well, I've got uh, Brendan was nodding at that, and I'm going to go to him and ask him to, if possible, incorporate in your answer um, 
how or just your thoughts on the future of the Olympics and that kind of thing. Because if you're talking about a large scale multi venue event, you know, in the context of that question, what's the future for those kind of large scale events of purely, quote, amateur athletes? Well, I, I, I think with the Olympics and a global multi sport event of that scale, um, it's mind blowing at this stage to, to just contemplate negotiating a protocol at that level. Like having mm -hmm. had my head in a domestic league, uh, we aren't even really seriously looking at the champions league. If the champions league or mm -hmm. the, I was speaking earlier today with people about the Asian champions league, that'll involve a hub, be it in, in, uh, um, who knows, because I was going to say Singapore, because months ago, Singapore was, was, was being congratulated for its response. Now it's going through a second wave. So um, the, the notion of international long haul travel, um, because the pandemic is going to be at different phases um, for, for a long, long uh -huh. period of time. And the concept that we can negotiate to the level of detail on a global multi-sport level, what we're, what we're presently trying to do sport by sport, I, I don't think we have the capacity or the knowledge to do that yet. That doesn't mean we can't have an Olympiad in, in July 2021, but a lot, a lot needs, need, needs to um, occur. Um, I agree with Gareth. We're coming back to play so quickly, not for social reasons, but for economic reasons. And sports, which primarily have a social purpose, they are under less pressure in terms of trying to uh, manage this risk and, and, and get the balance right between risk and, 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 and recovery. Um, on the question of integrity, I actually think it falls into a similar category. It is a balancing exercise at this point in time. Some of the feedback we had, for example, last week from the International Cricketers Association, Mark made the point about the ball. We might laugh about that. That is a real life issue uh -huh. in, in, in cricket. A spitball, which is illegal in baseball, is a work of art in cricket. Um, and so, therefore, um, in rugby league, for example, in Australia, they've gone to one referee instead of two. Um, what's going to happen to a player in a concussion protocol who um, not only would, uh, needs to leave the environment and go and get tested because we don't have the normal testing availability within the hub, uh, that person goes out goes into a hospital, goes into an area where there's a high level of uh, transmit, a high level of incidence of the virus. And they, can that person go back into the hub or does that person need to isolate for 14 days? And if so, what is the impact of that on the integrity of the competition if that person would otherwise be fit to play and happens to be one of the most important players in the competition? We're going to be dealing with all sorts of issues. We're going to have, normally you'd have in brackets after a team is selected, Sean Cottrell, injured, Mark James, suspended, Loic Elvis, quarantine. We're going to have <laughs> this unusual situation that we've never been through before. Why did I get injured? Because <laughs> you're anyway, a fighter. I'm a fighter, that's right. Never give up. Um, we've got some, we've got, so Tammy, this has provoked so many questions. I'm concerned we're not going to get through them. So perhaps uh, like you did direct it to one person, I'll ask the question you direct okay. to, to whoever you think is best placed. What are the possible implications that a player in the English league may face if they refuse to attend training, play games due to the pandemic, breach contracts, fine, et cetera? That's from Param Sampat. Um, well, I think, Loic, I'd be interested to know your thoughts, your thoughts on that, because, again, we've talked about it already, but there are going to be athletes that make the decision in their best interest and in the interest of their families. I mean, I have an immunocompromised family member, and I haven't left my doorstep but a handful of times because I'm not going to take that risk. How do you, how do you look at that from a, a breach of contract perspective? I, uh, I think Mark will correct me because I'm, I'm, I'm not like a, an English a common law expert, but my understanding of it is that uh, for an employer to ask you to come back, the conditions have to be met to ensure in good faith that there is no basically um, unforeseeable risk, right? So if a player now, that's what we've seen with the Watford player, um, Troy Dini, this week. Um, if the player is actually bringing reasonable arguments, saying that he's going to put his family at risk, here his uh, young son, who seems to have like breathing disorder, I believe there is no breach of contract. 
Um, the fifth proposition would be actually to, to, to defend them uh, if they decide so. Then where open questions will remain at this stage is, and this we see in Swiss law, um, could, could you actually as an employer argue no work, no pay? But this is not a sanction. It's like suspending services on both sides. Uh, what is quite clear for me uh, is that a player must not be disciplined because he has reasonable doubts as to the return to play uh, requirements being met or not. Okay, Mark, did you have any follow on on that? The UK government's advice has said so far that you can't be forced to go back to work if you feel that there are reasons mm -hmm. for not doing so. So I think it would be a very unwise PR step for any club at the moment to be contemplating sacking somebody when we're still in an unknown position as far as the protocols, whether they work or, or not, are concerned. But it's, it's, we're just as likely to find that by the end of next week, we don't move to step two. We're actually stopping all sport altogether because the quarantining's not working. Mm -hmm. So I think until we know that all this is working, uh, we can't just assume that it's fine. And I think, I think that any player at present refusing to play or train uh, they'd obviously have to be able to keep, be keeping fit um, in, in, in their own way, but I can't see them being in breach of contract for a, quite a considerable time yet until the safety can be much more highly guaranteed than it is at present. Um, Tammy, the, Tam, the only thing I'd say there, so, Sean, sorry to jump in as well, is it becomes really interesting. You've got two parts to this now as well. And again, Loic and Brendan would be very acutely aware of this you've got education and communication because i think what tends to happen you get a subtle media pressure which again is moving towards we want to get back playing football we need football back and you get a source who's always an unnamed source saying people earn x amount a week they should be prepared to take some risk and and, and there's this comes back to that balancing exercise again which is quite difficult sometimes but for me is critically important here because I thought Troy Deeney was actually extremely inarticulate in how he presented his position and his absolute clarity in the fact that obviously one all of the issues that we've discussed already but then a key one being having a young son who's got an underlying health issue and I think all of these things become important that there's um there's an openness and the trust builds from the fact of people knowing actually what's going on rather than a particular sound boy, sound bite that's being released to push a particular agenda. Um, on, on this point, I should add that, that on yesterday's panel on managers contracts, uh, there was a lot of discussion around UK um, labour laws in relation to uh, what uh, employees can do and what employees uh, employees can't do. Um, on that point, I don't know if he wants to put his mic on. I try and let you speak. Sean Jones QC, um, he's asked the panel as a cross question. I'll allow you to talk just in case. I know you just put something in the comment. I've given you rights to talk, Sean, if you want to, and unmute you um, if you're listening. Okay, I'm unmuted myself. Good, good man. <laughs> Welcome back. <Thank> you. <laughs> Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I mean, it really arises from our discussion yesterday. I think employers and which include obviously clubs are used to the notion that their duty is to take whatever reasonable steps they can to ensure a safe workplace. And in most sets of circumstances, that is all that can reasonably be expected. But the difficulty is that these circumstances are so unusual that you could as an employer do everything you reasonably could, and there might still be irreducibly a risk which an employee considered to be unbearable to use the language of section 44 of the 96 Act, circumstances of danger which they reasonably believe to be serious and imminent. So to, what I wanted to ask is whether panelists agree that we may find ourselves in a unique position where an employer can do as much as they like and as much as they can to try and reduce risk, but that doesn't necessarily make an instruction to return to work a reasonable one. Thank you, Sean. Sure. I, sure. That's great. Who wants first dibs on that one? <laughs> Everyone goes, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> um, I'm certainly happy to give a, a practical answer to that because what we're seeing in the United States, for example, in the major professional sports there, is that the leagues and the clubs are concerned about this as employers. 
And so they've certainly put on the table in bargaining the notion that return to play protocols would include an opt out for players. The question to be negotiated, I'm interested what the legal position is in England. What are the economic consequences where a player exercises um, that opt out? Uh, I think the other point to bear in mind too is the broad nature of the employment contract of the player. Whilst playing is the principal uh, responsibility under the contract, the player has many, many other obligations that he, he or she must continue to perform um, even during the period of the lockdown. The question was raised earlier about integrity. Um, certainly some doping controls are mm -hmm. under suspension at the moment, but it's not a license to go and breach all of the integrity rules that are in place. Players have to maintain health and fitness as best they possibly can in the circumstances. And we've seen an enormous effort on the part of players through social media and other mechanisms in order to continue to promote the game. All of this work can um, continue to be provided. Great. Um, I think that's good. I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take moderator privilege for a second and uh -huh, just put on it. my put on my physio hat for a second. <laughs> I think it's important that we're talking about the players' return to play, and I have my own personal perspectives about billionaire owners telling uh, labor of all kinds uh, what they should do while they're not involved in the direct communication of a virus. Um, but I think one thing that uh, I don't know that this, this warrants further discussion here, but I think we have to keep in mind that we're talking about the support staff as well. And so when the players come back, it's not just the players and the coaches. It's at the very least, it's the physios. It's whoever is in the, in the stadium doing broadcast production. Um, there are a lot of different people that are implicated here. And when you talk about the ability to opt out of showing back up, I don't think enough is discussed about the people that may not have the financial wherewithal or the union protection to be able to say, I don't feel bad. If I, as a physio, have a child with a breathing problem, I may be one of one or two physios working with the team. And so my decision to opt out affects in an entirely different way. So I think that when we're talking about this, we can't ignore the fact that there are other support staff that are just as uh, at, at just as high of a risk of contracting this or becoming vectors and that kind of thing. So I think that's important as well. Moderator privilege seated. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, you know what? I think you made a very, very, very good point. And I think it's really, it just, it's so complex. I think everyone's uh, articulately um, defined how uh, and described the complexities of this. It's a mess. And anyway, we'll come on to questions because there's some really, really good ones. Yep. So we try and go rapid fire. Just gone conscious. We've got 25 minutes left, and I'm, okay. I'm concerned that there's so many questions that we may not even get through them all. So um, Alexander Rash, Rash, I'm so please God, someone help me <laughs> with names. We're gonna go with Rojas. <laughs> By the way, just in case you I haven't always mentioned this because it um, makes me feel better. I, I am dyslexic, so please forgive me. And I'm from London, <clears throat> so that means that, that I'm ignorant of how you pronounce any, anyone outside of London's name. Um, uh, Alexander, I've, dis I've, I've permitted you to talk if we can hear you. I'm not sure if you would like to um, ask your question. I'll give you a couple of seconds. If not, I'm reading your question out and I'll leave you there in case you decide you want he's to. Still so he's still muted for what still, it's worth. I, uh, no, he's unmuted now. There we go. There we go. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. It's Rojas. Tammy, Rojas. get it right. Thank <laughs> you. Well, it sounds much better the way you say it, I can assure you. <laughs> the way it should That's be. Okay. Uh, so uh, my comment is basically uh, what I typed uh, for you. It's uh, the MLS here in the U.S. has proposed a World Cup-style tournament uh, for all the clubs, which is 26 clubs, uh, and uh, basically going to put together almost uh, 1,100 people, and they're going to have testing protocols and whatnot. Uh, but players have the option of participating in the tournament or not. So it, it kind of raises the question whether – uh, some of the players are going to be subject to being in breach of contract. Uh, I know we've talked about because of the virus, they shouldn't be in breach of contract. But conversely, if they're not getting paid, is the club also subject to a breach of contract? So it's an interesting uh, dilemma on how it's going to evolve. It's going to be uh, novel, I guess, Thank for, you. for everyone. I'm not sure. I think that's a good point. And for uh, people you. who don't know how the MLS works, I shouldn't even say the MLS. It's one of my least favorite MLS. glitches, just MLS. Um, 
you know, you're not talking about the typical uh, team ownership structure. The, the, um, the system of MLS is a single entity system. And so the decisions made by MLS for their players are different from the system that the EPL would be making, wherein each of the different clubs have that decision difference. So uh, who, wants, who wants to do the one answer on this? Who wants to take it? No one? I can try. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Uh, I mean, I, I agree with the idea of the opt-out and that it raises a lot of questions, but I'm not really comfortable with the opt-out uh, as, a, as a general principle. Even in, in a league like the MLS, you have big discrepancies uh, between like high earning and low learning, uh, earning. So w w what you, you could argue is what is the value of the player's freedom to choose to return to play or not in such sets? Mm -hmm. And then if, if we globalize the question, and we kind of come back to your question of the integrity of competitions as well, because to me, this is, this is connected. The, the duty of care did not stop during the, the lockdown. What we've seen in a lot of countries is that players didn't have enough money to put food on the table because they had to pay to take pay cuts. Sometimes they were not even paid or they, had, they were put on furlough, but they didn't have employment contracts. So there is no furlough. So if those players are being told we're coming back next week, no matter the conditions, they will. Plus, but here we quite away, far away from the MLS question, I'm sorry, but the, the issue is if they don't come back, the clubs will actually deem that they are in a breach of contract. And this is where we should kind of get a bit away from our Europe and, and slash Anglo-Saxon centric vision we might have sometimes. What we see is that a lot of players, they do not have access to any dispute resolution system that works. So the opt-out, yes, but we really have to look into the details of it because not every player is actually equal towards the risks, on, on even that, the economic risk. On that point, we're doing a project, uh, I'll put in the chat group, uh, <coughs> consultation uh, on dispute resolution in sport and COVID, in relation to COVID, and we're bringing together working groups from over the world uh, to look at this. And one of the issues that's come up, we've got a psychologist who's on there, clinical psychologist talking about the welfare issues. And we had a call this morning and primarily it was about access to effective dispute resolution. On that point, one of the consistent questions, and forgive me for not coming to you individually. Um, but actually, sorry, Sean, yep. uh, just one other point as well. Uh, it falls off from Lowick talking about that being, uh, uh, was having too much of an Anglo-centric view, is in many countries, of course, they're not employees, they're self-employed. Mm -hmm. And that raises a whole host of other issues that once we take it outside of that European, North American bubble, um, you've got a completely different idea of what a contractual relationship between the player and the club is, which throws, that, uh, throws a, a, a whole host of additional problems in there as well. And on that, um, on the on the related point, it is in this this whole you know again I know this is Brendan and, and Loic's is your sweet spot about the employment relationship and unionisation. Um, we've got one question from the, uh, and maybe I'll group them to make it quicker. Uh, Ajith uh, H, it says, uh, what are the remedies available to play if he doesn't play? And I know that we talked about that a little bit on yesterday's one on on manager's contract. Um, there's also um, another question on the same thing. Uh, we've got one on on head injuries. We've I think we should, Tammy, uh, we talked about it before. I guess let's allow 10 minutes at the end for that, I think, if that's okay with you. Well, I'd also like to make sure that we have enough time to talk about the implications of the women's game um, yeah, because absolutely. we've been talking about a variety of different deals, but return yeah, to play when let's do, let's on do, underfunded do, leagues. Okay, well, again, I think it relates to the contractual point as well okay. in terms of... Um, yeah, Sean, not Sean, the... Sean, just while you're talking then, then, so obviously we talk about the panel being about the duty of care mm. and the return to play. And then when you move on to the contractual issues and the fundamental reality of the industry we're dealing with is people are either going to take a proactive um, holistic view to dealing with all of these issues or they're going to look at it from a, a point of view where they will see an opportunity to cut costs. So we talk about the black swan or we talk about the things that have happened and we're talking about a lot of different conversations at the moment again. And this isn't me taking a militant player welfare position, but I'm just saying it's a consideration that there will, be, there will be conversations taking place now with lawyers where people are saying, how can I terminate the contracts? What are my uh -huh. grounds for doing so? And Lowick's point is really, really good with regard to the fact that it's going to take any player that long to bring an action to the necessary judicial body that uh -huh. we will have moved on so we can then look at taking. So it's a, it's, it's a, there's a power struggle 
and re in relation to how these things are going to evolve well as well. And you've got a really, really difficult situation in Europe with regards to that because you have, as we all say, the focus will naturally gravitate towards the top leagues. But when you move down UK, you have the EFL as an example, where you've got League Two, League One and the Championship. And people will talk about the integrity of those competitions. But fundamentally, there's also an opportunity where the stakeholders will seek to recalibrate the power with regards to who's in the ascendancy and how we can rebalance that scales, be it through salaries, be it through employment rights, be it through contracts. And obviously that varies on a great level as well across the world, which is again, the separation of models, be it collective bargaining agreements to actually how the contracts are dealt with. So duty of care, absolutely, which is where we're at, but I think there's a whole host of other issues that will, people are conscious of already, but will obviously develop and move on over the coming time. Uh, I, I, so, so essentially, it's all well and good having a contractual right, but you might not be able to enforce it or do anything with it because of the time it takes to do it. Um, Tammy, I'll hand over to you to, 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 to go on to the next point and then we'll come back. Uh, so we've got, we've got 20, oh, my maths is not good, 17 minutes left. So, we, uh, so there's two, two major points still to cover, then I'll let you take the next part. We'll try five minutes, we'll reduce five minutes to the head injuries and how this fits into others. And then there's um, a bunch of different points we've made and we'll just do rapid fire responses. That's all right. Yep. Yep, that's good. Um, so I can I can go ahead. I would like to talk about the um, you know to get Loic a real a real quick view on this uh, regarding and then Brendan the women's game and how the institutions and the organizations are stepping up for to protect access to the women's game, uh, whether that be at a grassroots level or from funding from FIFA or that kind of thing. Knowing that I'm somewhat putting you in a position asking that direct question, Loic. I start or Brendan? Yeah, um, if you if you give it a give it a All start, right. that'd be good. Uh, well, to me, that that like the women's game shouldn't be treated differently when it comes to the minimum standards, and then you need to put more emphasis on it for various reasons. If if you want to really safeguard what had been and was being achieved in reality in 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 the last years and month, um, our concerns are around the fact that a lot of players are not professional. They're not considered as such, even though in reality they should be. So they don't, the implications are that they don't have an employment contract, for instance. Uh, so when the pandemic started, what we've noticed in some countries is that those players, they were being asked to leave their accommodation, while actually the accommodation was the main uh, counterpart to their uh, contract. Um, and then if you don't have an employment contract, we come back to what Mark was saying, like how do you get a, a access to unemployment schemes? And then on a, on, a, on a broader scale, of course, if, if the game cannot resume with the same quality, uh, what is going to be the value of it? And then the, the knock-on e uh, effect is here. Um, can we sustain the same, the same uh, development as we had? So I think I, I really don't like when, when we, we take this as like men versus women. I just mm -hmm. really think that more efforts have to be put in countries where like you really have high standards for men more efforts are required for women in countries where the the, the, the conditions are as bad but then it's the same you really need to treat them equally and because in those countries what we've seen actually at FIFA is those countries where levels like standards were rather low for men then they are trying to correct the men's game and they forget about the women's game while yeah. the women's game was on the rise actually in the last month there as well so I don't like I, I, I don't want to name countries, but we've seen we've seen hardship funds in in countries that wouldn't apply to women. So the first division, the second division for men's leagues would receive a given amount, but not the women's first division. So I think this this is to be avoided. Sure. I think that's that's a great point that we need to keep there. You know, keep the advocacy going for that. Brendan, did you have did you have some quick thoughts on that? Yeah, a couple of points. Um, the first one at the moment is that we're focusing on return to play. And it's important to understand that the economic impacts uh, are greatly varied within the men's sporting arena as well. In fact, those sports with the large broadcast contracts are the ones in a best position to return to play, not only because of revenue flows, but also in order to be able to meet the costs associated with 
the protocols that we're talking about. They're not inexpensive. Um, if we look at the other European football leagues, for example, I'm based in Switzerland. It's a heavily dependent gate um, type economy. Mm -hmm. And we're even seeing it in the United States where some of the big market teams like the Yankees that have big broadcast deals are in a very different position to the more small market teams, which are more dependent on gate. So the economic impact um, is different and that's all being worked through now. However, we're now starting to look at the second big discussion point, and that's building sports so it come, comes back better. I mentioned earlier in Switzerland, the Swiss government has just introduced significant loans for soccer and hockey, the two major sports here, a condition of which is not only that they get repaid, that the, the cost base is made more sustainable, but that the industry has basically a capacity to survive six months or so in a shutdown scenario. The reason I mentioned government investment is that goes to social license. And any sport which is contemplating rebuilding better has to be absolutely cognizant of that social license. And that will uncategorically involve treating women equally and girls equally and building a, mag, a, a ma major footprint for women's um, sport. So I actually believe the opportunity will be very strong. I think there will be great demand. I think that demand will not have been destroyed by the close down. I think it's there. I think there's a great opportunity and there's much more flexibility in the cost base so that investment, um, if strategically made, can bring a much quicker and faster return on the women's side of the equation than it can necessarily uh, on the men's side of business, which has got inherited structures, which will be bleeding uh, at a very, very significant rate. I did some simple maths once that thought that you know, the United, if FIFA wanted to make women's soccer, the sport of choice for women and girls around the world, by matching the prize money scenario, they would go very, very close, just around the World Cup, to competing with the Women's Tennis Association in terms of economic benefits to soccer players against what is currently the leading sport. That's a very small investment for a sport like FIFA to make, which would actually give it a strategic strang stranglehold um, on the post uh, COVID-19 sports world. That's fantastic. That's wonderful information. Um, Sean, how are we on the, yeah. how are we on the questions, questions. or should we? Um, so we've got, we've got, I'll just go through them. We've got, what options of relief? This is from Akukwelebi, I believe, Akiyeye. Um, I, I'm sure I should have turned your microphone on, would be better. Um, what options or relief would be available to a player who gets injured or infected with COVID-19 in course of return to play? Uh, though he's, he or she's out of contract by the end of the season. Would the responsibility for his or her recovery be taken by the by his or her present club, or in the case where he or she has already signed a contract with another club, such as the contract is affected, what is what is he entitled to? Great question. I mean, that is that is a great question because we're seeing it with the push to get back to play before June thirtieth, because then players. I mean, that implicates the loan schemes, that implicates players that have already sold on to different clubs, that kind of situation. Uh, Loic, you are nodding and smiling. Do you have a do you have a quick thought on, on that? Yeah, because this is a topic we, we, we discussed even out of the COVID crisis. Like, how do you pass on actually this, this medical obligation once a player got injured towards the end of the contract? Uh, the reality is that it really depends on a, on a domestic uh, legis uh, legal level, basically. So I, I don't have a global answer. Uh, what I can say is that the player will be... Uh, in a better position if this happens in a country where there is actually a medical scheme, so the, actually the universal coverage that the state can uh, ensure will, will remain. If player he or she is crossing a border in, in, in those two countries have none of that, um, it, it doesn't look really good actually. And, okay. and we've had that in really uh, um, uh, sad situations where players become disabled and uh, the reality is that very often it's really hard to obtain damages in those situations. Yeah, I would think that. We got a next. Yeah, have we yeah, got a next question, Sean? Uh, Sir Sir Hat said Sir Hat Yilmaz, 
um, who was speaking yesterday, said, Gareth made some excellent points, but the question remains, who is responsible for protection of minors and amateur athletes in the current situations? Are the minors or amateurs the responsibility of unions? Like, well, I think the question there is, do the, do the minors have union representation? I mean, in the, United, in the United States, they don't. If you talk about youth sports here, they don't. If you talk about college sports, the NCAA has fought legally to prevent them from being able to unionize because they don't want the, the workers' rights. So I think unless anyone, ha anyone on the panel has anything more specific to say, I think the answer is no. that they don't have that kind so of That's quite concerning though, isn't it? Because again, yes. you, know, because you think, again, the economic pressures, and particularly we've seen you know, uh, players become like the, 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 you know, the, essentially the savior of the family in people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, right? And that pressure to return as it would do to, but particularly for a youngster whose family are relying on them to get the big contract. Um, oh, so Joseph Hodge says under 18s are members of the PFA. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and, sure, and to be honest with you, he's beaten me to it. But the, <laughs> point, but, but the point again that's interesting within that is 16 to 18s, there are all of the same questions we've discussed are relevant because 16 to 18s, you're, you may not be a professional. So you say you use the UK as an example. Again, you have a situation where 16 to 18 is a scholarship agreement, which is obviously the decision then sits with the club whether they feel you're worthy of a professional contract or whether a professional contract was part of your initial offer. So Serhat's question is really, really valid, but the, the scholars within the English professional game would have access and advice from the PFA. Amateur sport isn't unionised. And, and as I say, I'm not um, dismissing amateur sport in any way, shape or form, but with regards to how fluid and how quickly all of these things are moving, I don't think it's one of the key issues now, but yeah. will become more of an issue in the coming weeks. Um, Joe, well, actually on this point though, with the miners, Sirhat, we should chat about setting up a working group like we've done with the other stuff, open source research. We happily lead on that uh, with you. Uh, we can pull people together. I know Brenda's nodding as well. I think that's a really good point. Uh, well made. Uh, Richard Munro, Danny Rose has made uh, the point that players are being treated like lab rats. Some have suggested the Premier League training grounds, etc., will be uh, some of the safest places to work in the country. So he or she should be quite, quite happy to just go to work. Do you think that uh, being forced to work for entertainment, or as uh, Marcus Motter is on, or, or at least was on earlier, um, you know, sportainment, as he would call it, uh, purpose uh, changes the dynamic at all? I just would say very quickly that there's been uh, this this type of comment or the response to Danny's comments show the the emotive language and the judgmental nature in which the work of athletes uh, is dealt with. Uh, it's an everyday aspect of a job like the one Loic and I have, and the one and the work that Gareth is doing. You know, we, we did this, and and we're particularly when you were playing. You know, we're overpaid, lucky. Um, these types of issues actually can't distract us from dealing with the, the meaningful issues which are before us. We have to do that in accordance with principle. We have to do it in accordance with the evidence and the knowledge that we have. And we have to really value the, the voice of the players. And that type of reaction shows that how undervalued um, the player's voice uh, can be. Um, I think what Danny's saying, to paraphrase, and I did read that article, is that um, a lot of uncertainty exists around the science. Mm. Okay. And that's true. 100%, yeah. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Brendan, brilliant. But that comes back to what I tried to say earlier again around education and communication. And this is the point that on any given day, you may have... if. If Danny Rose, and if you look at, like, we, there's different panels and people will no, dis, no doubt discuss racism and diversity and how the players became empowered and started to shift the narrative around that before the breakdown or the lockdown. And again, that language around what Danny Rose is, he's perfectly entitled to be able to express his views, especially if someone asks him them. What you have then is we, we've spoken for an hour and 26 minutes about a host of issues and somebody may take a 90 second segment of something that somebody has said and look to manipulate it and use it in a particular way. And this comes back to the strength of the player voice to be able to um, not disregard. You have to obviously treat all of those comments with respect. But as Brian Clough used to say, sit down and have a discussion. I'm willing to listen to your opinion. <laughs> until you agree that I was right. And I think that becomes one of the issues around that as well. And, and, and I, I go back to my point, but like that's one of the things that I look forward to seeing more is that the players being well within their rights, given 
their help. I, I got, like, only on a small level, Sean, a comment, the French player that ended up in a coma hmm. and was close to death and then thankfully recovered. And there were, I received a message to say, well, at least that's good news to show that the players aren't in that real danger. So they should be able to return to play. So, it, so again, you've just got that education, yeah. communication and understanding around these things. Um, uh, uh, Michelle Vroker made a good point, basically saying, is this an opportunity when we're doing screening? Um, those of you who know her, she's a huge sort of athlete welfare mm -hmm. advocate. Um, that they could be basically look at um, her words were opportunity to combine health screening with anti-doping screening, et cetera, to save money. So at the same time you're doing, you know, one thing, why not do many? Um, not sure if it, that's more of a statement, I guess, or something we can. I think about. that's a good it's, point. It, Mark, do you have any thoughts on that? And oh, maybe just incorporate a, something about privacy in it as well. Data privacy coming from this could also be implicated. I, I think I, what Michelle said, I think is absolutely valid that we've we've heard for years that football is under tested in terms of doping, yet they're now saying that they're going to be testing people every day, every other day, once a week for COVID. Um, if they can do that, they must be able to do other testing as well. Maybe not with quite the regularity, but if they've got the money to throw at COVID testing, then it's clearly there to be able to do uh, anti-doping testing as well. And I think they're going to struggle in the future to justify the fairly low levels of testing that they have in certain sports uh, uh, when, they, when they've been prepared to throw as much money as they have at buying new equipment to be able to carry out these tests. Uh, simply to try and play nine games this season. Hmm. Well, I, I think it's an extraordinary view. Like the 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 we're dealing with a nasal swab as opposed to a blood or a urine test, although, um, um, and we're talking about risk management. Now, here we have an imminent risk that you're being asked to work in an environment with, to, to contract a virus which is highly, highly contagious, we can't effectively treat, and for which there's no vaccine against a statistical anti-doping threat. When we're talking, for which the players have signed up to the, all the protocols. So, you know, we, we, there's a good phrase that was mentioned to me the other day by Matt Graham, who I'm actually sitting in for our head of legal and yeah, player affairs better. the other day. He's not very well at the I think we're all just exhausted, but he used the phrase integrity creep and i think it's a great phrase that in response to some of these issues how can we get more access to the private information of the players and one of the things we haven't spoken about is how the broadcast could be transformed and the more access the broadcasters will want for the players to make it entertaining when we don't have a crowd uh, there's all sorts of issues around that but i think we have to be really careful about uh, well, creep is creepy, but we have to be very careful about the expansion of it. And I, I, I would have thought that that would just undermine the trust that something Gareth has spoken about, that we're trying to build in an uncertain playing group to get them to return to play with confidence. Um, uh, if that was put on the table, I would reject it. For um, um, Tammy and panellists, are you happy to stay on for a bit longer or not? Have sure. you got a shoot? Guys, are you all right to stay on? Because we've just got some questions and two people have put their hand up. One of them is Michelle's. I probably misrepresented her question. She's going to tell me off. And uh, <laughs> not looking forward to that. Um, one of the things I was going to ask, uh, we, <coughs> had the, we had the COVID panel uh, on football and Alexandra um, from FIFA Pro spoke about, so eloquently actually, about the lack of trust. And I've been having loads of conversations, as you would imagine, in organising this conference. And the repeated thing that's come up is a lack of trust players have of the ownership of, of football mm -hmm. clubs. So particularly on the point of reduction of wages, and I know we're talking about return to play, but uh, this seems to be a critical moment when you were talking about creeping and just you know, giving up powers. It's not like, you know, before this happened, it wasn't as if football was in a state of really healthy governance globally. Uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the beacon of good governance there was pockets of progression that was being made and, you know, not to say there were pe people who were terrible, but it's not as if it's, you know, a highly regulated market that's got, you know, uh, you know, risk and compliance processes in place, et cetera. At this moment in time, then when players have been asked to do so much or the risk is going on to them, doesn't that bring back into the question of like, who, how, do you trust the executive to make sure they're making the right decisions? I'll start with that. You absolutely do. I mean, there's, in the case of the fit and proper person test has left something to be desired for quite some time. And so I don't at all blame players for resenting the fact that folks who have their money parked in, you know, the Virgin Islands 
are somehow implying that the that the athlete should be taking the hit for this. Um, yeah, I, I think that... I think it's, the, just, it's interesting because I, I was trying to make the connection between the lack of financial transparency and just general other, you know, fundamental principles of good governance where, you you know, again, if you're if you're going to say, hey, we're in this together, let's do it together, then you want everyone to be transparent as possible. And, you know, mm-hmm. Eric, I know that was you know, Alexandra's point, which was like, hey, we want this collective solution. We need a collective solution, but we can't, it can't all just be one way. I'm not sure, like, if you had something you wanted to say. Um, I don't know for how long you want to extend the conversation. <laughs> well, let, let, let's, we've got a couple more questions. We've got one from Saud, um, but if you want to take a quick response. Yeah, I sure, I can. So for sure, like, the, the, the good governance was already, I know, an issue before the, the COVID crisis. So actually, we are, w- what we're facing is that the issues are even more prominent. Because the lack of collective uh, discussions, not even, let's not call it collective bargaining, but just like social dialogue or collective discussions um, is, is so obvious now. So if you, if you take a timeline, for instance, and let's say that like collective discussions should have started once everybody was invited, which is like around the beginning of April when FIFA dropped the guidelines publicly. Um, what happened after that is, is, is that, well, a lot of federations didn't really react. Um, they were not really proactive. Then you can argue that other stakeholders were not some of our unions as well, which shows that there is definitely a lack of, of discussion going on out of the crisis. Then when it comes to the lack of trust, this, this is like very, very obvious in, in, in some countries, especially when you get in, in lower leagues where there has been no discussion for basically ever. And then the crisis hit and every player was told to take a pay cut or at least a deferral and in exchange, financial transparency was asked, but it's been refused constantly. And even in, in, in big countries, what some leagues or clubs did is that they just gave like some, I don't know, aggregated numbers, not even club by club. So it, it made the entire negotiate, like the possibility to negotiate in good faith has mm. been really complicated when negotiations were actually going on. And in some countries, no negotiation at all happened, even at that point. And there is, there is definitely, I'm not saying I have the, the solutions, but there is a, gov- yeah, there is a governance crisis. Um, so, so with, 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 with um, a government funding then coming in, uh, it seems to bail out on this social license. And mm-hmm. this is one, again, I know what's coming later in the week. So, you know, stay tuned for all these different discussions. But, but it seemed to me as well that there's going to be this, uh, this I think there's a, it seems to me that maybe there's this moment in time, is sport having the social impact that it says it is? Is it doing what they say they're doing? Yeah. Um, let's come on to more questions. So, um, Sean, so- can I just one last thing on that, which is Go quite interesting. And again, I talk about like, I look at the panel on my screen here, right? And so many people I have huge respect for, right? The next part of that is coronavirus has accelerated a host of issues that a lot of everybody on this panel would have discussed previously and nobody wanted to deal with before. Now, the danger is that they don't remain the critical co- topic that they need to be as opposed to back to what I said earlier about people using it to uh, manipulate and put forward their own particular objectives. And I think that's one of the things that has to stay very much in the focus is that what, we're, what situation where are we coming from and what has COVID-19 presented mm. and whether that can be used to fit in with what you've said there about a social license or an opportunity to take our sport to a different level. And I think that within any question that's asked over the coming weeks and months, that still has to be an issue that's pushed, be it union from a union side with regards to player welfare, looking after mm-hmm. players properly, but also asking the question that you've asked there. And it might sound, um, it's not looking for a utopian outcome, but re- with regards to what type, what type of sport do you want? What, what, yeah. what do you want? And, and, and I think that's going to be key. Thank you. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, I may really quickly, yeah, yeah, sure. I think I will hand over to Brendan actually, because um, the governance issue, one could say that it's that the governance in football is better than most sports in the world. Yeah. And football is actually in a way better spot. So there's been collective discussions on global on the global level. We've been involved in many of them. But then when, when it comes to other sports, because you have players in different sports, there there is close to nothing happening, to be honest. Um so uh question from Saud 
uh, Zulik, well, I'm going to paraphrase because you mentioned the specific clubs and uh, or at least specific areas, so I won't be so specific on this. But I think it's an interesting counter view. Is also what happens for the clubs who are struggling financially, essentially, and players are using this as, an, as a reason to breach contracts and to, to move on to other clubs in other countries because they see it as an opportunity to to terminate because they're saying that we don't you're using them. I don't want to. I don't feel safe to return to work as a, as a as a tool. You know, like in most things, we can't disc- this. I think it's fair to say you can't discount that people, not everyone behaves impeccably at these times. We've seen this from owners of football clubs. I'm sure we're going to have the same from players and other people. Um, any views on that in terms of, you know, it goes both ways, essentially. He says, uh, who's going to uh, protect I, the clubs in that environment? I'm seeing that everyone either doesn't disagree or agrees. So I think, yes, that's, <laughs> okay. a, that's an excellent point. It's an excellent point. Okay, great. Okay, and we're going to cover it in other, no doubt we'll cover it in other points and particularly mm-hmm. in the COVID one that, that, that uh, Brendan's going to speak on in a couple of weeks' time because we'll have some further research um, on that as well in terms of uh, with the Sports Law and Policy Centre with Michele Colucci. Um, Just make a 10-second point, Sean, and that is on the whole, players have come to the table collectively and agreed to extraordinary readjustments of the economic circumstances and the level of pay to help industry get through this, this, this incredibly unprecedented challenge, challenging period. Okay, thank you. Right, Christopher Flanagan, really quick question, and then we, we're going to have to give five minutes to the, the um, concussion point neuro- neurodegenerative diseases elements in terms of, let's just have a quick short, known COVID almost, but what's going on in that space? Uh, Christopher Flanagan. I'll just uh, uh, so I'll unmute you. Hopefully you're still there. Thanks. Yeah, I am. Um, a question for Loic, because it's something that I have spoken about to him very briefly before a conference last year. There was a brief mention of personal data there, and there's a specific issue with health data. Testing will certainly involve processing and possibly publication of health data, which is special category data under the GDPR. I know that players' personal data is something that Fifth Pro have looked at generally, um, and indeed there's a specific FIFA regulatory regime mm. in relation to it now. Is that special category data point and personal data rights in general in relation to this health information something that you're considering specifically in relation to the pandemic? Great question. Uh, in a G- look, it's, it's a very tough one. Uh, <laughs> A nice yeah, easy one yeah. to end on. <laughs> no, 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 I, it, it's okay, actually. I'm just trying to, to scope it. So if, if you take a GDPR approach, uh, since it, it, it's actually like a standard that everybody knows, but you also have other uh, highly standardized uh, systems in California, for instance, or even in countries such as Argentina, whatever. Um, I think you, have a, you need to keep this multi-layer approach. So like for sensitive data within the framework of uh, being processed within the framework of the, the employment contract. So can the player return to, pay, to play based on this medical data? Uh, you could argue that there is a contractual and legitimate purpose for the club. Then, of course, the, the question is going to come uh, much more complicated to answer when those data are then sensitive data are being shared with other clubs because maybe other clubs want to know if the other uh, team is uh, free from uh, the virus and then when it's going to be released publicly. So you could also include that in a the, in the return to play protocol that uh, clubs have to enter into, nego- into discussions with their, with their players because I'm pretty sure that in a lot of EU countries still, um, this is not uh, contractually agreed at this point, like you know the pathway of uh, sensitive okay. data. That was a great um, answer, by the way. But in a short period of time, that was a pretty robust answer. <laughs> So like, like I said, you very really thought it out very well. I'm, I'm impressed. Um, uh, that's really good. Uh, Michelle Broken, quickly, and then we'll come on to the uh, to the um, concussion, stroke, neurodegenerative sure. disease, and injuries mm-hmm. point. Um, Michelle, I'm unmuting you. Hopefully, we can hear your wonderful voice. Thank you, Sean, and uh, thank you, panel. It's been a really great discussion, and uh, the reason for putting that little Tinder box uh, question out there. Uh, well, but well bitten, um, Brendan. It, it really is about the exploitation. I'm really concerned about the exploitation of this situation when it comes to duty of care, because uh, the second part of my uh, uh, question was about you know there should be consistency because as I see it, 
the anti-doping officers that are turning up around the world are using self-declaration. So uh, if self-declaring that you're symptom free is the way forward to give people that close access to uh, players, but we're not doing that with, with players themselves, it seems illogical. But the medical data management is a huge issue when it comes to duty of care and the exploitation that goes on this the exchange of that data when it comes to the transfer market is something that really does yeah. need to be addressed thanks michelle that's more of a comment but it was lovely to hear from you anyway and thanks for that. it was thought provoking I like the term tinderbox i tell me i'm gonna hand over you to, to to try and deal with in a, in a very short period of time with um uh, <laughs> just so concussion head injuries in oh, yes <laughs> oh, oh, that small topic so, what's going on <laughs> CTE, discuss. Um, we, got a, we got a question before the panel um, from uh, Adam Pendlebury uh, asking about, um, and he specifically cited Steve Smith, the Australian cricketers, uh, being allowed to continue to bat after taking the blow to the head um, in the ashes in 2019. Um, and he asked if the current framework is fit for purpose. So in the context, since COVID is a obviously a more urgent well, I shouldn't say urgent, but possibly more temporarily, viscerally urgent matter right now. In the context of concussions in return to play, um, do we have a robust enough return to play system that we can piggyback the COVID onto? Or is the head injury issue still such a pantheon of madness that no one really knows what to do? Um, I don't know who would like to take that first. Well, I'm happy to introduce it, given how hard it's it's been an issue for for us. And the, for example, the National Football League Players Association probably has the biggest medical uh, department of any players association in the world, and it's the sport which has the acutest problem in terms of uh, concussion. Um, it's a unique area. It's funny that it came in cricket because we probably think there's two areas where the athletes shouldn't really have a say. Okay, might sound crazy. Absolutely equal agreement on the protocol, but not on its execution. Uh, one is the security test. Should we play in an, in an environment uh, which crickets often had to go through where there could be a heightened threat of a terrorist attack or something like that? Players in the main will be willing to take the risk, especially if it involves representing their country. And secondly, as we've seen again and again, especially in soccer at World Cups, it seems to really come up. Athletes wanting to go back onto the field of play when it's clear that they're, they're concussed. Um, the NFLPA has a protocol, and so does rugby, which we would regard as being among the better ones. And that's because it's science-based and it's collectively bargained by unions, which are very strong. Now, that might sound like a self-promotion for, for the unions, but it's the, it's the harsh reality. Football is still looking at it from a, from a sporting point of view. They will say, well, you know, the, the additional substitution could be... Um, manipulated. It's very much looking at this through the paradigm of, of sport um, as opposed to what this is. And we know scientifically that the brain, the head is incredibly vulnerable post that traumatic blow to the head to, to a second secondary blow and to put an athlete back into a sport like football where head clashes and that occur is, is inc for me a, a, a risk that couldn't be defended. Um, so the question that arises, what happens when the laws of the game conflict with the laws in um, um, relation to occupational health and safety? And would the laws of the game provide a defence to the employer? I can't possibly see how an employer in England could say, look, I put my worker into an unsafe situation at the behest of an organisation in Switzerland. I don't think that would be a defence. Um, and so I think it's time for football to get serious on concussions um, and learn from the best. And rather than take this defensive approach that we see again and again, Maybe uh, pick up Gareth's point earlier. What can we learn from COVID-19? Let's embrace this and lead. Let, let's make football the safest sport. That's a competitive advantage for football at a time when, when mothers and fathers are worried about their kids getting hurt. Make it a competitive advantage. But if you're going to make it a competitive advantage, you've got to walk the walk as well as um, talk the talk. 
Well, I'm ah. not sure. well, I think that's quite a good way to end, I think, actually. I was going to say. No, Laza, give that man a round of applause. Let's do, <laughs> let's do this. Change the world. Let's go. <laughs> um, no, but I think, yeah, I think the, 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 that ending on, on positivity of what can be done if everyone comes together. And I think there is some, you know, we shouldn't be too harsh about what's going on in the world. I think there's a lot of people trying to do the best they can with whatever skill set they've got or resources they've got. I think most people are actually aligned on that. Different people have different, as, as, as Brenda said, paradigms of, of how they, and, and viewpoints of how they come to it. Um, thank you so much. That was awesome. Tammy, you're, you're a, an amazing host. I knew you would be. So I feel well, like you gave me a great team you know, to work I, with. So. Yeah, exactly. Joe, you know I feel and this is as close as I'm going to get to being a football manager or something. I feel like I'm picking an all star team every time at the moment. So I'm like, yes, that was another good panel. No, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and thoughts. As I always say, and I'll keep saying it, we don't pay anyone to speak. Everyone here is based because they're experts in their field and they can represent a, a stakeholder viewpoint. Um, they're knowledgeable. The amount of time that people give up for these things is just incredible. If you actually knew how much time people give up, I mean, these are busy people and they give up so much time likewise with everyone asking the amazing questions you know that that causes an enrichment if we can you know address the 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 uh, knowledge gap then we're all moving in a, in a better direction thanks to everyone who's taken part as i said we've had 80, 85 plus speakers over the next 20 over 22 sessions over the next two weeks we had 40 countries who tuned in just yesterday uh, to be part of this and we've seen that from from the number of uh, uh discussions and questions we had i don't know about you guys my wife's doing an amazing job looking after. I've got two two young kids. I mean, honestly, she's, she's the, the unsung hero for the last Tell month. Tell her I said hi. I mean, unbelievable. And they, and they haven't come in once. It's incredible. Um, <laughs> normally, I see a Batman appearing. Um, I don't know about you guys. I'm going to grab a glass of wine now um, and then take over with the kids. Uh, thank you all. Um, the recordings are available. Now, Zoom has been a pain to give people access to. I'm not going to lie. Is You think if you registered, you get access. No, you have to register again. So what we've done is just today, in rapid time, we're setting up a page on Lauren Sport that's going to have all the videos. So anyone who's registered can get access to it. With this one in particular, we're going to put it on YouTube just because uh, it's such an important issue. So we'll send everyone the link because I think it needs to be shared because there's some real... Um, such an important topic right now. Please give me a virtual round. Well, not give me a round of applause. I haven't done anything. But anyway, give everyone else a round of applause. Uh, they're awesome. You're awesome. Uh, let's have a great weekend. Uh, and we'll come again next week with some more discussions and questions and that. And again, carry on the discussions online, on Twitter, wherever you are. Thanks, thanks guys. Really appreciate you know, your efforts. It was like uh, impressive. Thank you. Well done, Sean. Yeah. Great thanks to see everybody. Take thanks, care. Have, have a great weekend. Right. Stay safe. Weekend. And also thanks Hello. to the team. Hello. Sorry, selfishly, I haven't even said thanks to Rushdam, Chris, Amy, yes. and John and everyone who's been like, here, here. like plugging away like, like absolute troopers in the background. So uh, legends, thank you. All right, bye guys. Take <laughs> care. Thanks, bye.